Greetings Endgame fans. The position in this video comes from the recently completed online FIDE Olympiad. And this was a six board international team competition. And interestingly, each team had to be structured uh, in such a way as to include um, young players and female players. So each team had to have at least two juniors uh, defined as uh, anybody with the date of birth uh, in the year 2000 or later. And at least one of these juniors had to be female. And in addition, there had to be at least two female players overall. And so this led to some uh, very interesting uh, team clashes. Now the time control for the event uh, was a uh, rapid format. So the players had an initial endowment of 15 minutes with five seconds increment uh, per move. Now, uh, the, in general, the Waldsman would not usually analyze endings that arise in, in rapid games. And this is because uh, in rapid, it's just not reasonable to expect the highest standard of play in endings. And uh, the reason for this is because um, players tend to use most of their endowment trying to solve difficult middle game problems. So by the time they get to the ending, they're very often just playing on the increment or on the increment and uh, a minute or two. But the Olympiad was such a special event that uh, we're going to make an exception in this video. And it's worth noting, though, that uh, the rapid play format uh, does generate chances. And as we will see, uh, if you have a knowledge of some basic uh, ideas in the endings, well, this can help enormously if your game reaches the end game. OK, well, the the position we're going to, going to look at comes from a game played in Division 2, and it was a clash between Germany and Belarus. The division consisted of five pools of 10 teams, with the top three teams of each pool qualifying for the next stage. Germany and Belarus were drawn in Pool A, and in this match, the scores on the other five boards were tied, and so the result of this game determined the match's eventual outcome. Well, let's introduce the players. Playing white was Lara Schultz, and uh, she's based in Hanover in Germany, and is aged 18 with a FIDE classical rating of 2300 plus. And her opponent playing black was Olya Badenka, an international master with a FIDE rating of 2400 plus. And uh, Olya Badenka is also aged 18 and has just uh, enrolled as a student at the University of Missouri in the United States. OK, well, having introduced the players, let's try to evaluate the position on the board with white to play. Now, black has a number of assets in this position. I think black is a pawn ahead, at least temporarily. Um, she's managed to get her king in front of the white e pawn. It's on d7. And the rook is uh, behind the pass pawn, currently on, on c3. But unfortunately, um, White's past e pawn is just too strong, and uh, the 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 game position is is a loss for Black. Now, the the easiest way to win this position would be just to push the pawn immediately, since six comes with check. And if Black goes um, King c7 here, then White can just keep pushing. She can go e7, and uh, there's not much to be done about this. Um, Black can give a check, she can go rook f3, but white just needs to exercise reasonable care in order to win. So you need to um, keep the king, the black king away from d7, and you also have to keep an eye on the e8 queening square. But uh, white can get out of check by going to e6, so d7 is now, is now covered, black's king can't go there. And after rook e3 check, uh, white's king can go to f7, and the white king uh, is influencing the, the e8 square. And from here, well, the game might finish, um, say, king d7 might be played. But white can now give a check, forcing the black king away from the pass pawn, and so gaining some time to capture the a pawn. And from here, white's, white's winning plan is simply to um, round up the h pawn, and then white will set up the, uh, the Lucina um, one rook and pawn ending. So e6 would have been um, would have been decisive. However, Lara Schultz didn't play uh, e6, and instead she elected to 
give a check, she played um, rook a7 check. Uh, and black replied by, by playing king d8. And in this position, white decided to grab the a-pawn. She played rook takes a5. But this was, uh, this was a mistake. This was, so this was too hasty. Um, white wants to grab the a-pawn, but um, you want to grab the pawn when black's king is a safe distance away from the queening square. So the, the correct move would have been to play rook a8 check first. Black's king, let's say, comes to c7. And now you capture the a-pawn with rook takes a5. And this position is lost for black. And it's lost because her king is a long way away from the h-pawn. And that what this means is that there's just no way that black can uh, give up her rook for the e-pawn and then try to draw with, with king and h-pawn versus king and rook. That's just not going to happen. Um, now, uh, black can put up some resistance, so black might go rook f3 check here. White's king will go to e7, making way for the e-pawn to advance. And black could play rook f5, and this, this sets up um, a pin. The e-pawn can't move uh, because of the position of the, the rook on a5. So that's, that's a, a decent uh, enough try. But unfortunately, white can give a check. She can go rook c5 check. And after king d6, attacking the rook, then king d6 is, is a perfectly safe move. Um, so black might go h5, hoping for a hasty e6, which we should drop the rook on c5. But instead, um, white can break the pin with rook c6 check. And after king b7, it's safe to push e6. And after the further moves, say rook f4, well, white's just going to go king d7 and it's game over. Um, the e-pawn is going to cost black a rook, and the king on b7 is just even further away from the h-pawn. So there's just no, no possibility of, of uh, escaping with the draw. Okay, so um, that's what, that's what uh, really should have happened in the game. White should have, white should have played uh, rook a8 check. But instead she went for this, this capture. Uh, now let's pause to, to evaluate um, the, the ending that we've got on the board. Now what's interesting about it is that um, if you took away the, the black h-pawn on h6, then what you would have um, essentially is, is the famous Kling and Horvitz 1851 endgame study. And it turns out that to hold the game, black needs to blend the ideas of this study into the game situation. So Olya Badelka started well enough. She went rook f3 check and white replied um, king e6. And now there are two possibilities for, for black in this position. There's, there's the move that um, Olya Badelka played, which was h5. But it was also possible in this position to play the move rook e3. And the idea of this move is that it puts some pressure on the e5 pawn. And although that pawn is currently defended by both the king and the rook, the fact that it's attacked by the black rook does limit um, white's options. So what can white do in this position? Well, it's pretty clear that king moves don't get white anywhere at all. So if she goes king f7, say, well, black is just going to give a check and that's going to force the king back again. Nothing has really been gained. And similarly, if, if white were to go king d6, then the black rook checks again from the other side. And the idea of this move is that if white um, counters by, by blocking with the rook, then black can safely just trade rooks off. And we end up with a drawn king and pawn ending. Um, so king moves are, are no good here. So we're going to have to look at, at rook moves. So let's see what happens um, when white goes rook a7. Well, it turns out that black can just wait. She can play rook e1 here. And after, say, rook d7 check, then black occupies the, the queening square. And the idea of giving this check is that white wants to go rook h7, threatening checkmate and threatening to capture the h-pawn. But black says, OK. And the best way to draw is to just go king f8, because now black's king is on the short side of the pawn, which is, which is the side 
you want to have your king when you're, you're defending if you can if you can uh, possibly arrange it and after rook takes h6 black goes rook a1 uh, and after rook h8 check king g7 rook b8 well black can go rook a6 check and black has successfully established a, a draw a drawing uh, philidor position so rook a7 is 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 no good either if uh, in terms of uh, in terms of, of winning chances so the only thing left to try is rook a8 check black must go king c7 that's the only legal move and here the the best try for white is to go is to go rook e8 so let's pause again here now without the the h pawn if we were to just take that h6 pawn off the board off the board then we would indeed have the kling and horvitz position and um the the drawing move for black in this position is to go rook h3 and the idea of this move is that if white goes king f7 then then black can go rook h7 check and we're actually going to see this uh, in practice um, a bit later on when we look at another variation uh, but um, the, the point is that uh, the h pawn is on the board and that means that um, black can't carry out this rook h3 rook h7 idea because the, the pawn is in the way however the existence of the the h pawn means that um, that black can uh, draw with a move that would lose in the klingon horvitz position so black has got the waiting move rook e1 available here now without the h pawn rook e1 would lose to king f7 um, after black waits again let's say rook e3 then white plays e6 and and this position would be a loss but here um, black can can capitalize on the fact that she's got this extra pawn she can go h5 and after the further moves rook f8 king d6 if white goes rook d8 check then then black's king can cross the e-file the king can can go in front of the uh, or rather can go behind the pass pawn because after e7 black has got king f4 and notice the the distance that the, the black king has traveled the king is now very close to the h pawn and the h-pawn is, is on the fourth rank. And what this means is that black can now draw the game by giving up her rook for the e-pawn. So, so rook e3 um, would, would, have, would have been a draw. But there was nothing wrong with um, the move that uh, Olya Badelka preferred. She went, uh, she went h5 here. And that's, um, that's fine. And now this move was, was met by rook a8 check. Again, there's only one legal move for black. She must go king c7. And now uh, Lourish um, Schultz play rook h8. And we've reached the, the critical position in the game, and indeed the critical position in this is Germany-Belarus uh, uh, match. Uh, and here black went wrong. Um, she played the move rook a3. And this is a mistake. Um, and it's a mistake because uh, you, you just cannot go for a, a Philidor type uh, defensive setup when your king is on the, the long side of the pawn. This is only going to work if you have your king on the, the short side of the pawn. It needs to be over here. And the problem is that on, on c7, um, the, the black king and rook are just going to get tangled up. They're going to get in each other's way. And that's what happened in the game. So the game concluded uh, rook takes h5. Black went rook a6 check. White went king e7. That's an ideal square for, for the king, making way for the uh, e-pawn to advance. Um, black went uh, rook a7. Look, the, the king is in the way. That's, that's not a check. These pieces are, uh, are tangled. Um, White played rook h6, which was which is quite a witty move, um, and and we'll see. Uh, it's witty because um, if black gives a discovered check, if she goes king c8 check, then then white just plays king e8 
and improves her position. Um, so instead, the, the black rook went to a8. White pushed, she went e6. Black went king c6. And now white went king f7. And you can see why rook h6 is, is witty, because um, it's going to be white that, that turns the tables and gives, gives a, a, a winning discovered check, uh, not black. So black went king d6. White went e7, discovered check. And the last moves in the game were king d7. And now white went um, rook h1 and, and rook d1 is coming. Uh, and uh, that's, that's, that's game over. So, um, so black resigned here. And Germany um, took the match three and a half points to Belarus's um, two and a half points. Okay, so um, so let's go back. Um, let's go back to this position. So we've established that, that rook a3 uh, is a losing move. Now, what else um, might Black have tried here? Well, tempting is is the move um, h4, but this would also have lost. Now, White um, captures the pawn. She goes rook takes h4. Black goes king d8, trying to get in front of the uh, pass pawn and, and over to the short side. But uh, white's not having it. Um, she goes rook h8, check, forcing the black king back to c7. And and now after after king e7, um, white will be able to establish a, a Lucina uh, winning position. So let's just uh, let's just go back a, few, uh, a couple of moves. Um, Let's go to this position after, after rook takes h4. So a slightly um, tougher defence would have been to play this move rook e3. And we're, we're seeing in a number of variations um, that the rook e3 is a good move, pressuring the past e pawn. And um, this move would have obliged the white to find the, the only winning move in the position, which is the move rook d4, cutting the black king off along the d-file. Um, and white wins um, because black's king is on the long side of the pawn. You have to remember that long equals wrong. So here if black goes rook h3, white has king f7. And after rook h7 check, because there are only three files separating the king and rook, the king is able to close down the distance uh, on, on, the, on the rook. And now um, Rook h1, e6, rook e1, uh, white goes king f7, and you know a Lucy, Lucina uh, winning position is again uh, is again looming. So h4 um, would also um, have been uh, been insufficient. So let's go back again. Um, now here there was in fact a way for for Black to to draw the game, and the route to the draw was through applying the Kling and Horvitz uh, endgame study. And if you've, been, uh, if you've been paying attention to the previous variations, um, you'll probably have worked out for yourselves what the drawing move is here. So black must play rook e3, pressuring the e-pawn. Um, and this just restricts white's options. So white will go rook takes h5, Black goes king d8. White tries the old trick of, of rook h8, forcing the black king back to e7. And now white goes um, goes rook e8. And we have reached the, the Kling and Horvitz uh, study with the defending side on move. There's no longer any uh, h pawn on h6. Um, and so this means that black can deploy the, the wonderful defensive resource that, that, that Kling and Horvitz um, discovered. And that is the move rook h3. And despite the fact that black's king is on the long side of the pawn, and that there are only three files separating um, the, the rook from the past pawn, it turns out that the rook h3 is sufficient to draw. So let's have a look at, uh, at some of the, the variations, because um, they, they are truly remarkable. Well, let's first of all look at the move king f7, which, which is the most natural move in the position. 
But this is it now easily refuted because uh, black goes to rook h7 check. And this time after king g6, well, black has got king d7 and we've got a double attack. Both kings are attacking the rooks. And this is now sufficient to draw because black is going to get his king, rather her king, in front of the, the, the e pawn. OK. So let's go back. Um, now, what else can, um, can white try here? Well, let's see what happens after the move rook g8. So the rook goes to g8. Now, the rook is no longer um, defending the, the e-pawn um, with, with an x-ray. So black's correct response is to go back to e3, renewing the attack on that passed pawn and restricting white's king. And here, if white goes king f6 with the idea of going e6, well, black's king immediately takes the opportunity to go to the d7 square. And after rook g7 check, king e8, white goes king e6, threatening mate, then the black king goes to the short side of the pawn, goes king f8. And after rook a7, rook e1, we have got a, a standard um, drawn defensive setup. So rook g8 uh, is, is, uh, is insufficient as, as well. OK, well, um, what else can, can white try? Let's, let's try rook f8, see if, see if this makes any difference. Well, surprise, surprise, black meets rook f8 by going back to e3, targeting e5, and therefore stopping white from playing the move king e7. So white will go rook f7, check. Black's king immediately tries to get in front of the pawn and over to the short side with king d8. White goes rook a7, say. Well, black has nothing better than waiting, but waiting is, is perfectly sufficient here. And to make progress, then white has got to go king f6. And as soon as the king comes out from behind the pawn, black checks with rook f1. White's king has to go back, and so the black rook goes back. And there's just no way that white can, can make uh, progress from, from this position. So rook f8 is, is insufficient as well. Well, there's one more thing that, um, that white can, can do in this position, and that is to try the move rook e7 check. Again, no surprise, black meets that by going king d8, reaching the eighth rank. And after rook d7 check, black's king occupies the queening square. And now if white goes rook a7, threatening mate, well, black can meet this with rook h6 check, and we reach uh, another Philidor defensive setup, which is a draw. And so, so rook e3 would, would have made the, the draw for Belarus. OK, well, as ever, the position was chosen for its instructive value, recognising that players of all ages and genders make and can learn from mistakes in the ending. And I hope that um, by watching this ending, you, you've, you've seen how... Uh, knowing a uh, you know, basic position, the Kling and Horvitz, and, and um, relating it to the game situation can help you um, with, with, your, with your results. Thanks for watching.